This week is Parshas Re'e. Re'e means literally see, but it also means observe, it means ponder, it means behold. And we pick up Moshe's telling the Jewish people, Behold, I am giving to you today a blessing and a curse. Moshe is presenting the world in a very binary fashion. On one hand, you have the blessing, and the blessing is, the, is if you uh, heed and hearken the mitzvahs of the Almighty that I am commanding you today. That's the blessing. And the curse is if you do not heed the mitzvahs of Hashem, your God, you deviate from the path that I command you, you go after foreign gods that you have not known. And this essentially is a tr- transition. Until now in Deuteronomy, in Devarim, we have been, Moshe has been giving criticism and preparing them intellectually, emotionally, ethically, uh, giving them the ammunition to survive in the new world that they're about to enter. Uh, the next section of Deuteronomy, of Devarim, essentially this week, next week, and the following Parshios, they deal with mitzvos, and particularly mitzvos that are going to be relevant to the Jewish nation in Israel. And for example, this week's Parsha, Parsha Shrei, has 55 different mitzvos uh, related to new issues and new realities that are going to be facing the nation once they get to Israel. Now, it's interesting, uh, just Rashi in the second par- pasuk, the second verse of the Parsha, Rashi examines or points out that there is a uh, equivalency in the pasuk, in the verse, between avoiding mitzvos, deviating from the path of God, not listening to the mitzvos, and idolatry. And this is an important point, and it's brought elsewhere, but here is where one, it was one, of, the, one of the sources uh, for this idea, that mitzvos, we think they're not an addendum to faith. It's not like you have faith, and you believe in God, and you avoid idolatry, you don't believe in other gods. Oh, and then there is mitzvos on the side, so to speak. That's behaviors of religion. And you can have faith without mitzvos. That's what people assume erroneously. Here, in this verse, in these two verses, in the introduction to the uh, barrage of mitzvos that we're going to get from here uh, uh, for several chapters, we're told that the mitzvos are interlinked with faith and inseparable from faith. And therefore, if someone deviates from mitzvos, they're actually deviating away from God and they're embracing idolatry. And in, in Jewish philosophy, I think Rashi brings it down here as well, the one mitzvah of idolatry and of avoiding idolatry is equivalent to the entire Torah. Because the objective of Torah and the objective of mitzvos is to deepen and nourish the relationship a man has with his Creator. And therefore, all of mitzvos is encapsulated in the idea of uh, of rejecting and repudiating idolatry. And therefore, conversely, when someone rejects mitzvos, they're actually embracing idolatry. This is, this is a, I think, an important idea that maybe could reorient and reframe how we view mitzvos. They're not good deeds. They're not, well, they are good deeds, of course, but they're not limited to the idea of being a good action or a good deed or a nice thing or ethics. It actually gets to the core of man's mission in life. Our mission in life is to reconnect with our soul, to reconnect with our creator. It's to live on a spiritual plane, not only on a physical, mundane, earthly, uh, uh, trans- transitory ephemeral life. It's not just as a body. We're living as a soul. We have an eternal destiny that we're striving for. And all that is captured in Torah and mitzvos. But specifically here we're told when someone wants blessing, when someone wants to connect to God, that's done via mitzvos. Conversely, the curse, if someone abandons mitzvos, it's as if they're abandoning God and embracing a foreign god, and 
by definition, they are limiting themselves to a very narrow worldview, a worldview that only has this existence, this ephemeral existence, this life that passes by like a fleeting shadow where you're here for 70, 80 years, and most people don't even have such a blissful time here. There's so much suffering. And then people who embrace the Weltanschauung of the curse, well, that's all there is. It's a series of distractions and then death forever. And ironically, those people actually get what they asked for. You know, They determine that they want to live a life that is limited to this world. And you know what? They get that. Because if someone does not live in this world for next world, when it comes to next world, they're woefully unprepared and they're not an eligible candidate for admission. So it's it's ironic and it's, of course, tragic that people can actually create which worlds they live for and that is the worlds that they live in. If someone says, I want to live for this world and I want to ignore and eschew mitzvot, ignore and eschew God... You know what? They're, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They come to the next world, and they're not a good candidate for admission because of their choices. And of course, there's no greater curse than someone having to uh, suffer and live a life of uh, lacking meaning and to take their soul, which is composed of the eternal realm. It, it's from the other world... And it unfortunately will get, uh, su- will succumb, and it will be vanquished by the choices of man, which is a very important introduction, I think, to the themes of the parsha and the themes of the uh, significant uh, next section of Deuteronomy. Now, another introduction, verse twenty nine, talks about the Mount Gerizim and Mount. Abel. We're actually going to see a little bit more of this in a few weeks. But uh, Moshe is instructing the nation that when they get into Israel, one of the first things they need to do is find two mountains, Mount Grizim and Mount Abel. And the nation is going to have this monumental uh, standoff, so to speak, where half the nation is going to go into one mountain, And half the nation is going to stand in the other mountain. And the Levites are going to be in the middle. And they're going to have these pronouncements of blessings and curses. Blessings on one mountain, curses on the other mountain. And this is essentially to to start off the experience in Israel on the right foot. There, we know historically you're going to spend 850 years uninterrupted in the land. And as we see, the theme of Deuteronomy is they're going to be faced with a lot of challenges a lot of new problems that are going to arise, it's very important to to begin that experience on the right foot. And we'll see the actual content of those blessings and curses in a few weeks. Now, I want to look at verse 32, the last verse of uh, of chapter 11, because if you read the verses of Deuteronomy, it seems like we've seen this so many times before. And you shall guard to do, or to perform, all the chutim, all the statutes, all the mishpatim, all the laws that I am commanding you today. And I once read that if you tally up all the times in Deuteronomy, it says, Ushamartem lasos, or lishmar velasos, to guard or to observe and to perform, it shows up more than 50 times. And I, I, would, I think it's striking uh, that there is, what we would say, redundancy. There's repetition. It's the same words, the same content, the same ideas that are being repeated again and again, endlessly almost. And, of course, the obvious question is, well, we, we get the lesson. We understand. Like we, we understood it the first time. Why does it need to be repeated to us so many times? But I think this does, again, continue with the theme that we began to understand, if you understand the magnitude and the importance and the severity and the gravity of mitzvos, 
and what the consequences are on either side, embracing mitzvahs on one hand, rejecting them on the other hand, embracing God, rejecting God. This is what matters. This is the only thing that matters in life. This is the most important thing. And when something is so important, you say it again and again. And even though someone may have heard it once and intellectually they are aware of those concepts, the objective is not to have these ideas remain theoretical and abstract, but to have them penetrate and integrate into who the person is and who, and to mold and craft these people into a nation that actually breathes this idea, that lives by these principles. And to do that, it's not enough to just say an idea, oh, I got it, move on. I, you could get it theoretically and still live an entirely different way. And therefore, I think, you know, uh, just a simple understanding of this verse that it's, it's so common in Deuteronomy, and indeed, you look at the next verse, in the first verse of chapter 12, it's the, same, it's the same thing. These are the laws and the statutes that you should guard to do. The same uh, juxtaposition of guarding mitzvahs and performing them uh, in the land, uh, it is to impress upon us how critical mitzvahs are, how indispensable they are, and how they are the determinant. They what they determine blessing and curse, meaning uh, versus uh, a life of uh, lacking meaning, and a life of the body versus a life of the soul, a life embracing our Creator, and a life, God forbid, of going the opposite way uh, to idolatry of its various forms. Now, chapter 12, Moshe tells them, Again, something we've seen before. Uh, verse 2, you should surely destroy, utterly destroy all the places where the nations that you shall possess worship their gods. You go into Israel, in Canaan, and there's a lot of nations there, and they're all idolatrous. And they have various temples of worship. And there's the high mountains, and on the hills, and on the leafy trees. It tells Moshe, you have to destroy it. You shall break apart their altars. You shall smash, smash their pillars, their sacred trees. You should burn them. The carved image you should cut down. You should obliterate the names from, the, from, the, from that place. It's interesting. Like Moshe is telling them, when you come into Israel, you take a sledgehammer and an axe, and you walk over to every idolatrous house of worship, every tool, every vessel of idolatry, every... In, indication of idolatry. You have to obliterate their names from the place. And I was thinking, just a way of understanding this. You know, the Jewish nation, they came from Egypt, and we're told in the sources that in Egypt, unfortunately, many Jews actually capitulated and started behaving like the Egyptians. And indeed, the Talmud tells us that they were distinct in name, in culture, in dress, in language, only. In behavior, the Jews and the Egyptians were indistinguishable. So the Jews in Egypt, um, several decades prior, they had idolatry as well. And they, perhaps their parents or their grandparents, you know, for hundreds of years they were in Egypt under the very convincing very powerful influence of idolaters. And they're going to a land, and the land is heavily steeped with that same drug that they were previously addicted to. You know, they were, they were heroin addicts, so to speak, in Egypt. They participated in activities that were euphoric, were joyous, were pleasurable, but also detrimental detrimental in a spiritual way. And they left. They left Egypt. They said goodbye, so to speak, to their drugs. But now, maybe they've been clean, they've been sober, so to speak, for a few years. But they're about to walk in to the biggest junkyard or junkie yard in the world. A, a land that is unfortunately been taken over by the idolaters, by the heroin addicts, and there's heroin wherever you turn. Tells Moshe, how do you ensure 
that the addiction does not resurface. You know, today they tell the addicts who are coming, who are fighting their addiction, that even if you're sober, you're clean for 20 years, you're still an addict. So you have a nation of addicts, and they're about to face a grave test. You know, they're the recovering alcoholic who has to spend the rest of his life in, a, in vineyards where there's so much wine they could just imbibe whenever they want. How do you prepare for that? Tells Moshe, you take a sledgehammer, you, take, you smash every remnant of the idolatry, you destroy it. And I, th- I think a corollary to this is um, the Talmud talks about various individuals that lose their ability to be kosher witnesses. Uh, the verse tells us that you cannot have a thief or someone who's dishonest or sins in matters of money. They, they're not reliable as a witness. And the Mishnah tells us some examples of people that have sketchy relationship with finances and are not believed are uh, dice players, which is uh, gamblers, degenerate gamblers, or people that used to race pigeons, or uh, used to engage in cockfighting, or people used to lend with interest, which is prohibited by the Torah. But again, that's an example of someone sinning based upon of their desire for money. And uh, it's interesting, the Talmud discusses, well, how does someone undo that? How does someone who was previously invalidated to testify because they were a gambler or whatever, how do they undo it? And I think it's really interesting that what it describes is very similar to what we see over here. It talks about uh, various, I guess we could call it chips. You know, someone's a, he's a, he's a gambling addict and they used to have these paraphernalia they would use for their gambling and they have to break it. Says the Talmud, when does someone undo it? When does someone free themselves from the clutches of addiction? They have to break the tools that they use. They have to flush the weed down the toilet. They have to break and crack and shatter and smash and destroy utterly the tools that are associated with that prohibited act. It's interesting I, I th- I, the Talmud, this is the Talmud in Sanhedrin on page 25b, if you're interested. But the Talmud says here that someone who lends with interest, when, when is, uh, h- how do they know that they have freed themselves from their behavior and can now be regular members of the society when they don't even lend to non-Jews with interest? The Torah law is that you may lend with interest to non-Jews, but not to your brethren, to your, to your Jewish brethren. Someone who lends with interest to the Jewish brethren, well, they're invalidated to testify in a Jewish court. How do we know when they have been remedied from this behavior? When they don't lend to, even to non-Jews. Says Rashi, that the word interest, the idea of usury, the name interest should be forgotten from their mouths. They have to totally go to the opposite extreme. They have to even forget the names, so to speak, of the activities that they used to partake in. When they have a total rejection of the forbidden behavior, when they destroy it, they either break the paraphernalia, etc., that's when they know that they indeed were successful, and they won't have a uh, res- recidivism, or however you pronounce that word. They won't go back to their behavior. Interesting idea. I think a very powerful lesson. Uh, okay, so now, so it talks about the houses of worship of the non-Jews, of the idolaters, but it says, well, don't do the same thing for God. You can't destroy, of course, the altars of God. And then it transitions into talking about building a permanent temple. Of course, the Jewish people have a tabernacle, a mishkan. They, we read about it in Exodus and 
Leviticus, end of Exodus, beginning of Leviticus. And once they get to Israel, they have to find a location for a permanent temple, an actual building that's not a one that you disassemble, reassemble, it's one that has uh, permanence. And there you bring all your sacrifices, uh, etc. So there's a prohibition. Once you establish a permanent place of worship, of, of bringing sacrifices, there's a pro- prohibition against using private backyard sacrifices. And uh, so it tells him, you cross the Jordan, you settle the land, you find the, lo- the location, wherever God decides to have his uh, name rest, there you bring all the sacrifices and all the tithings, and etc., etc. And you be joyous, bring your children, make pilgrimages there. That's the, uh, that's the verse, uh, that's the, 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 the matter that is discussed in the uh, chapter 12. Now, I think it's, it's really interesting here, just a, f- a few points here. It discusses what happens when someone wants to eat meat. So, of course, we know when someone brings a sacrifice, most sacrifices, the meat is consumed by people, by the Kohen, by the owner, by the owner's family. Each sacrifice has its own laws. But what about if someone doesn't, he just wants to eat, he wants to have a steak. It's a perfectly normal desire. What then? How how is that done? I think it's really fascinating if you look at how this is the section that talks about unconsecrated meat, meat that's not part of any sacrifice. So look at verse twenty here. When Hashem your God will broaden your boundary as He spoke to you, and you say, "Hmm, I would like to eat meat," for you have a desire to eat meat. To your heart's entire desire, may you eat meat. The Torah obviously believes that there's nothing wrong with eating meat. Eating meat's fine, it's healthy, it, the Almighty gave us animals for our pleasure, for our enjoyment, nothing wrong with that. Well, let's look at the context for how you're supposed to eat meat. If the place where Hashem your God, verse 21, will choose to place His name, will be far from you. You may slaughter from your cattle and your flock that Hashem has given you as I have commanded you, and you may eat in your cities according to your heart's entire desire. So, someone is living, I don't know, in Houston, Texas, or in Toronto, Ontario, and they want to have meat. They want to have a steak. Well, what do they do? Do they go to Israel, bring a sacrifice, and then eat the steak? Well, that seems kind of inconvenient. It's far away. You have work. Well, what then? Says the verse. Well, if you live really far from Israel, if it's just not convenient to go and bring a sacrifice... Of course, eat as much meat as you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Slaughter it. Make sure it's kosher and it's fine. I think that this is a very powerful idea. What this shows us, that the standard meat meal, like the Jew, there's a temple. And in the temple, you bring sacrifices and you eat meat. And someone wants to eat meat. What do they do? They bring a sacrifice. They're including God in their world. Yes, you want to have meat. Why? Because it's delicious. Okay, how does God? Fit? How do we find a way to have to bring a spiritual component into this experience? Well, you bring a sacrifice, and then you have the meat, and you have also the spiritual activity. That's a standard meat meal. However, verse twenty says, "Well, well, what if you live really far away and it's really not convenient? It's there's extenuating circumstances. You really want the steak, but you happen to be a thousand miles from the temple. Well, of course, then you can eat regular, unholy, so to speak." Uh, unconsecrated meat. And I think this is a, a, a very, to me, when I read this, this was like an attitudinal shift. And again, this continues with the theme of the Parsha. The relationship that we have with God is not some nice thing that is done some of the time, or it's added on to our lives. We have our lives, and part of our lives is there is a religious component. There's a box that we check. It's religion. Oh yeah, religion's very important. Here we see that the, the objective is not that religion should be part of our lives, is that, to the contrary, a regular meal, there's nothing wrong with it, a regular meat meal, 
But that is out of the ordinary. That's the exception. You have it to be far away. You can't bring a sacrifice. But the idyllic, utopian world, so to speak, that, we're t- that Moshe is telling them we're trying to build here is the fact where someone is so intimately connected to God, they don't do anything. Even something as simple as having a stake, they don't do anything outside of God or outside of having a religious, religious by the wrong word, a spiritual element. When you're feeding your body, don't forget to feed your soul. That's normal. Normal food is, well, you have a body, you have a soul, both of them need to eat, let's have a steak, and let's have a sacrifice, everyone's happy. That's normal. That's not something you do for religious occasions. That's not something you have to get dressed, so to speak, in fancy weird clothing and speak in Hebrew and foreign languages and do something out of the ordinary for quote-unquote religion. It's a, it's a life view. It's an outlook where you look at yourself in a holistic sense and you try to engage with the agenda of your body and your soul, where you're not neglecting your soul. And you, it's not that, you know, your life is your body and your soul is something that, oh yeah, I can't forget about that. You are a body and a soul together. And if you want to give pri- primacy to one of them, it has to be your soul, which is eternal. Your body's only here for a couple of years. It's not you, it's a tool. You are your soul. You want to eat meat? Sure. Okay. Is that going to be an activity that is bereft of who you are, your soul? Of course not. We'll bring a sacrifice. Well, what happens uh, in the unlikely event that that your soul cannot be directly fed with this experience? Okay, fine. Let's find some other solution for that. Have a regular meat meal. But I think this is just a powerful idea that religion or God and the relationship that we have with God and mitzvos, they're not a nice thing that we add onto our life. They are our life. That's what Moshe is trying to tell them. Having a physical experience, a mundane physical experience that does not have a spiritual component is totally fine. But it is not, it's not out of the ordinary for the nation of The Jewish nation, the chosen nation of God, doesn't forget about God for a second. I think a very, very powerful idea. Now, verse 21 here, also just another, another just anecdote or, or nugget that is brought over here. So it's describing consumption of meat outside of the temple. Where is that? It could be anywhere. You could slaughter, you know, a lot of the kosher meat that we get today is from Argentina or from Iowa. It's not in Israel and it's, you know, but it's still kosher meat because it's slaughtered and produced, manufactured under the, all the laws are fulfilled. Well, what are those laws? So if you read verse 21 again, you'll see that it talks about those laws. If the place where Hashem your God will choose to place His name will be far from you, you may slaughter from your cattle and your flocks that Hashem has given you as I have commanded you. And you may eat in your cities according to your heart's desire. We have to slaughter our cattle and our flock as God commanded us. Where did God command us how to slaughter our cattle and our flock? So if you look at the beginning of Genesis and you read every verse very, very carefully, all 5,845 verses of the Torah, and you get to the end of the Torah and the end of Deuteronomy, you won't find any verse that describes how to do it. And that would raise a question. As I have commanded you, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 21, God commanded the Jewish people via Moshe, how to slaughter animals in the kosher way. But we have no record of it at all in the written Torah. You won't find any reference of how to do that. And I think, 
you know, we say that the written Torah is only part of the entirety of the Torah. There's a written Torah, there's an oral Torah, and each one without the other is incomplete. Well, how do we know that the oral Torah wasn't made up by a bunch of charlatan rabbis uh, 2,500 years ago? That's a common question that you hear. Well, you know, the Karaites, that was their thing. The written Torah is complete. The oral Torah is a farce. Let's just follow the written Torah. In a similar way, I would say the Sadducees, even though they weren't religiously motivated, separate question, of course, but they too rejected the quote-unquote rabbinic Judaism. I'm putting air quotes here. Rabbinic, as if the rabbis made up a new form of Judaism that wasn't part of, so to speak, God's communication to the nation. That's only the oral, the written Torah. So I pose the question to those who are convinced that the written Torah is from God, the oral Torah is from man, made up, how do we have a verse in the written Torah that clearly references some other communication that is also part of the same giving transmission of Torah? It says over here, as I instructed you, and it's clearly not referencing to any sort of order of instruction that is finalized in the written Torah. And this is presented, this verse, verse 21 of chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, is a proof that the oral Torah, or at least the existence of a oral Torah, is indeed referenced and supported by the written Torah. Again, there's many other ways to go about this. If you're interested more, I did. I have a podcast called Torah 101, which is an intellectual's introduction to Torah. If you want to understand what Torah is, how it works, who wrote the Torah, how do we know who wrote the Torah, what's the oral Torah, what's the written Torah, how are they interrelate with each other. There's about 10 hours worth of material on this subject. Go, go through it very thoroughly. But one of the proofs is right over here. In verse 21, it says very clearly in the written Torah that the oral Torah exists. Very interesting little bit of information here. Verse 23, verse 24, verse 25, talk about not consumption of blood. If you remember, we actually had it several times in Leviticus. Uh, We had it even earlier in this chapter, in verse uh, 16. It seems that the Torah loves to tell us that consumption of blood is prohibited. So the question is, you know, why is it so important to tell us? Well, we know you have to drain the blood. Uh, There's a whole process where... um, Kosher meat is salted to make sure that all the blood is extracted. But why is it so important to be told again and again repeatedly that it is prohibited to consume blood? So there's a very important Rashi here. Say ulamad matan scharan shel mitzvah. Come out and study the reward of mitzvos. What does the verse say? The verse says, Do not eat blood in order that it will be good for you and for your sons after you, because you're doing what's right and what's appropriate in the eyes of God. How do you make that your kids have a good life? Of course, every parent wants their kids to have a good life. How do you do that? By not eating blood. Says Rashi, blood is actually not quite tasty. People don't desire covet blood. It's not something that we have an urge, but we have to withhold from it. Yet the Torah says, despite the fact that you don't even want to eat blood, if you do, if you refrain from blood, says the Torah, I'm promising, you and your children after you will have goodness. Well, how much more so with regards to theft or sexual matters that a person does desire how much more reward will the person glean from that? The Torah is telling us a very powerful idea. Yes, we don't want to eat blood. And we've been told beforehand that blood is, consum- is, is not allowed to consume. But here we're being to- what's pointed out here is the fact that there's an enormous amount of reward. Reward that transcends generation. It's intergenerational reward. You and your children will benefit for not doing something that you don't want to do anyhow. That's not such a great accomplishment. It's not like, (laughs) but for the Torah, you would be all over it. Give me a vat of blood, let me drink it. 
And still the Torah says, I'm going to give you a huge reward. How much more reward will we gain from withholding from activities that indeed we are desirous of? We're told in the Mishnah, Lefum Tzara Agra, to the degree of pain is the reward. How much pain do we have that we don't get to consume blood? Very little. Yet the reward is astronomical and intergenerational? Just think about the reward for things that are really difficult for us. And there's a lot of pain that we have to overcome that. And it's not easy. And maybe we struggle and maybe we fall, but we fight and forge ahead. Those things, the things that are difficult to overcome, I in low rasa, as the Talmud says, and I cannot see. It's not possible for the human intellect and the human vision and the human imagination to f- grasp what kind of reward is awaiting for tzaddikim in olam haba in the in the next world. Chapter thirteen begins with again another theme we've seen throughout Deuteronomy. Observe the mitzvos. Don't add, don't subtract from them. The mitzvot, the Torah that we have from God is perfect, and therefore we don't add nor subtract from it. And then it goes on to tell us that what happens if you have a seer or a prophet or a guru or someone who has visions or claims to have visions, who does miracles, a soothsayer, a fortune teller, someone who's walking in water, dare I say, and he comes and he tells you, let's go do idolatry. Don't listen to him. God's testing you. God wants to see if you love him and are committed to him. Only follow God. Only fear God. Only observe the mitzvahs of God. Don't reject the mitzvahs of God. Listen to God's voice. Worship him and cleave to him. And the person who is the false prophet should be executed. That's what the verse here says. And I think it's, it's interesting uh, there's a, f- a framework that Maimonides is, is, um, lays out in, 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 in great detail about how to understand this. The verse begins, chapter begins, by telling us the Torah is perfect. Don't add, don't subtract from it. Well, how could the Torah be perfect? The only way the Torah can be perfect is if it comes from, from God. Well, how do we know it comes from God? Because Moshe is a verified prophet. The prophecy of Moshe is on a higher level than the prophecy of any other prophet because Moshe, we were there. We witnessed his prophecy at Sinai. All the way back in Exodus, we said, chapter 19, verse 9, that God tells Moshe the reason why we're going to have the Sinai experience is to substantiate and verify Moshe's prophecy as a direct conduit from God to a nation. It's almost as if, a very modern example, there's a phone call between the God and the pro- between God and the prophet, between God and Moshe. And the Jewish people are going to listen in. They're going to tap the conversation. They're going to listen in. They're going to participate in it as well. At Sinai, God speaks to Moshe, and God speaks to the nation as well, but also to Moshe and the people here, and therefore they believe that Moshe is a real prophet forever. You look at Maimonides' 13 Principles of Faith, he's very careful to point out that Moshe is a different kind of prophet than all the other prophets. He's the father of prophets, and therefore his prophecy is in a different realm. Why? Because Moshe is the one who gives us the Torah, and therefore it's important that there's no... We're not trusting Moshe because he's charismatic, because he's clever, because he's impressive. We're trusting Moshe because we know what he says comes to him by God from God. And therefore, when Moshe tells us Torah, we know that this is the perfect Torah. So the verse starts, don't add, don't subtract. Someone cannot come and say, oh, Moshe's Torah was imperfect. Well, Moshe is the greatest prophet. And therefore, if you want to question his corpus of prophecy, you have to have someone who has at least the same degree of verification. And you know what? We never had that. And therefore, we can't accept that. Well, what if you have a different prophet who comes and does miracles? Well, 
Yes, he may be a prophet based upon proof of miracles, but you know what? That can be the work of a charlatan. That is still a lower level of verification. When someone does a miracle, is he David Copperfield or is he genuine? You don't know. It's not verified with the same way as the Sinai verification. And therefore, such a prophet, if he comes to challenge what Moshe is saying, he is definitionally a false prophet. A false prophet is executed. Very uh, nice uh, way of understanding. And also uh, to understand the just the primacy of Moshe's prophecy, if you're interested, I did give a class on it um, on my other podcast called This Jewish Life. That's the name of the podcast. I don't remember what the title of the uh, class was. But uh, a couple of months ago, I spoke about this, if you're interested, in, in, in grave detail. Okay, so uh, verse 7 begins talking about what if you have someone who is leaning or, or is trying to convince, trying to corrupt someone else to follow idolatry. This is uh, when someone is a, um, a peddler of idolatry, he's trying to influence negatively, we treat him very harshly. He doesn't have that same rights uh, that all defendants have. And, uh, for example, the halacha is, when someone's trying to convince others to do idolatry, you don't need to have warning. In the Jewish court of law, capital punishment cases can only be meted out when someone was forewarned immediately prior to the offending act. As opposed to a masis, someone who's trying to convince others to do idolatry, it's such a severe, egregious activity that they don't have that same rights afforded to other defendants, and they can be executed even though they weren't forewarned that such behavior is an executable offense. And then it talks about, verse 13, it talks about what happens if you have an entire city that adopted idolatry. It's a very interesting uh, case here. It's just from verse 13 all the way to the end of chapter 13. You have an entire city that the city as one adopted idolatry, the entire city is to be destroyed. All the booty is burned in the in the in the public square. Everyone is everyone is is executed, and you have to get rid of this blight from amongst the nation. That's what the verse says. Uh, the Talmud tells us that the ear Hanidachas, the city that is entirely adopted idolatry, the wayward city actually never happened, and never will happen. Well, if it never happened, why is it important for us to know the laws? Duroj for Tabel Schar, study it and gain reward. I think perhaps we could say that the lesson is uh, how do you have a nation, uh, how do you have a city that the entire city goes one way in a very extreme way away from God, away from Torah? This is a nation of Jews, not a nation of Gentiles. How does that happen? The answer is that bad company will invariably influence a person. It's a city of rebellion. It's not a collection of individuals that independently arrived at that conclusion. We tend to underestimate the impact that our society has upon us. We like to think of ourselves that we evaluate critically every decision that we make. Maybe not everyone thinks about like that about themselves, but certainly... You know, we like to think of the fact that what we believe is what we got there because of our own cognitive processes. Here we're told that this is a city of rebellion. The inhabitants are, they're, they're subject to the city itself. If there's an atmosphere of rebellion, it's going to affect everyone in the city. You know, the Talmud tells us that the most important thing to do when you select a place to live is to look at the neighbors. You know, I get, um, you, you see today, everyone's uh, obsessive about uh, home decor and home improvement and how to, you know, get more sunlight or what kind of pool to get or what color asphalt for the driveway or how to make, uh, you know, what, what paint colors, uh, how, how big is the house and, uh, you know, what, uh, what's the size of the lot? A lot of questions people ask about a prospective home. Talmud tells us that the most important thing is to look at the neighbors. 
Because what is going to be more influential on the bottom line of man, on the totality of man, on man as a holistic entity, as body and soul, what's going to actually engender change much more than the decor or the layout is the neighbors. And here we see that if someone has bad company, has bad neighbors, it's very likely that they will be influenced from uh, from them and, and follow, uh, sadly, a path of bad behavior. Verse 14 begins with a very interesting law regarding someone who is mourning a dead person. It says the, and also has an interesting introduction. You are children to Hashem, your God. You should not cut yourself. You should not make a bald spot between your eyes for a dead person. When someone feels terrible anguish and pain and suffering and sadness, when a loved one dies... They have an instinct to cause pain to themselves. And I guess it was a common practice that people would scratch themselves and expose blood. They'd start bleeding, cut themselves in mourning or pull out their hair in anguish. And this is a prohibition. For you are a holy people to Hashem your God and Hashem has chosen you for Him to be a treasured people from among all the people on the face of the earth. So it's interesting, the Talmud tells us uh, this verse, which teaches us not to cut yourself over a dead person, teaches us another lesson. Lo tis go to do, lo ta'asu agudot agudot. Don't make divisions, don't make factions amongst the nation. That's another lesson derived from this verse. And it's interesting that you know, you you think about the idea of national unity. You know, it's we just got through the holiday of, or I guess the sad holiday, the, the day that marks the saddest day of the year, the Tisha B'Av. Temple was destroyed. Uh, Judah was destroyed. The nation was sent into exile. A lot of bad things happened. And the Talmud tells us that this was because there was infighting. There was sectarianism amongst the nation. And here this, the Talmud tells us that this verse tells us that we are not to make factions amongst the nation. And it also tells us not to rip ourselves over a dead person. And of course, the question is, why would you use, why would you use a mitzvah that, if you just read quite simply... Uh, it's talking about someone scratching themselves, and why would this be the place where you want to hint about the fact that the nation as a whole should not have factionalism? So I heard a an, an amazing idea in the name of Rabbi Schneer Cutler, a blessed memory, the former head of the yeshiva in Lakewood. He said like this, The Jewish people are a collection of individuals, yes, but spiritually we're one entity. We're almost like one body. I've mentioned before, the Talmud tells us that when someone takes, re- uh, takes revenge against another person, it's as if a man was with a sickle in the field and by mistake he took the sharp sickle and cut with his right hand his left hand. His left hand is now bleeding profusely and the left hand gets upset, picks up the sickle and slashes back at the right hand. Of course, that's nonsensical. If you hurt yourself once, why should you hurt yourself again? Uh, But the idea here is that the Jewish nation are like one body, one entity. When someone is upset over the death of a loved one, they may want to take their right hand and come to the left hand and scratch themselves. Of course, that's nonsensical. Why would you cause pain to yourself? Sometimes maybe people would be motivated to do things that are nonsensical. But it's a nonsensical idea. Says the, says the Torah. You know what is exactly like taking your right hand and scratching your left hand? Causing deliberate pain to yourself? Infighting amongst the nation. Factionalism amongst the nation. You are like one people, one entity, one body. And therefore, when you attack your fellow Jew, you're essentially attacking yourself as well. Uh, we have another 
brief primer on the laws of kosher, which kosher animals are cons- uh, which animals are kosher, split hooves, retus is cud, kosher fish, kosher birds. Uh, and then verse 22, we're told that uh, we have to give tithing. And indeed, verse 22 is the source that if someone gives tithing, they become rich. Someone gives charity, they become rich. Talmud tells us in the book of Tainus, page 9a, that this is the one area in life that someone is allowed to test God. Generally, we're not, we're not allowed to test God. We can't say, oh, I'm going to desecrate the Shabbos, and if God doesn't like it, let him strike me down. That's not, pro- not allowed. However, someone can say, I'm going to give charity, I'm going to give 10% of my money to charity, and I want to test God if he makes me rich. That's the one area where that is allowed and encouraged. And in the old days, when the temple was extant, the tithing was done uh, with um, giving to the Levite. The Levite was the spiritual uh, volunteer of the nation. They didn't have their own land. They were there for the betterment of the people. And therefore, the people were told, you have to give money to support the Levite. So verse 27 here. And the Levite... You shall not forsake the Levite who is in your city, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. Uh, he is dedicated to the spiritual well-being of the nation, therefore it is upon others to support uh, their physical well-being. Chapter 15 talks about the Shemitah. Now we've learned about the Shemitah before. There's another wrinkle added to the Shemitah. Uh, here in chapter 15 of Deuteronomy, every seven years you have to uh, not... Um, you have to allow the land to lay fallow, lay fallow to not engage in any uh, activities of agriculture. And, and additionally, we're told that all loans are, uh, are annulled at the end of the Shemitah. And it's interesting, just simply put here, uh, what happens is if, if I lend someone money and the Shemitah comes at the end of the Shemitah, that gets dialed back to zero, the loan goes away. Now, additionally, we're told that we're not allowed to withhold from lending someone because that loan may be annulled by Shemitah. So it's interesting, Talmud tells us the book of Gittin, that Hillel, the great Hillel of the turn of the millennium in Jerusalem, he, in, he popularized a loophole around this problem called the Prusbol. Essentially, I l- I lend someone money. At the end of the Shemitah year, that loan will go back to zero. However, I can assign the court, the Jewish court, as my proxy. And therefore, the the recipient, the borrower, now owes the... He owes me, but via the court. And therefore, because it's not an individual's loan, it's a court's loan, that does not get annulled by the end of the Shemitah. And uh, this, by the way, is the source for uh, the, well, this is the first time where the word tikkun olam appears uh, in this context. Where Hillel, tikkun prusbol, the pnei tikkun olam. Hillel, he enacted, he established the prusbol, this legal loophole around the seventh year nulling all loans, because of tikkun olam. And I want to just quickly point out that this, it could be abused. The idea of tikkun olam could be abused. Hillel did not actually change any Torah law. What he did is he took a, a loophole that was that was present and he popularized it. But what was his motivation for doing that? His motivation for doing that was the fact that the Torah itself says that there is a terrible problem with someone not loaning money because Shemitah might annul that loan. And therefore, people were withholding from lending money. And that is against the verse uh, that tells us that you cannot withhold lending money because of a fear that Shemitah might annul that loan. And therefore, comes along Hill and says, to uphold the Torah, let's popularize the loophole. Uh, for someone to use this same terminology and say, well, Hill will change the Torah. First of all, Hill didn't change the Torah. But if someone could say, Hill will change the Torah, I can change the Torah too, and I'll follow the same banner of Tikkun Olam, that's a fallacy. First of all, Hill didn't change the Torah. He just popularized a loophole that was already present, number one. Number two, his motivation was not to destroy the Torah, but 
quite to the contrary, to uphold it. Finally, we get a list of various holidays, various festivals, the three major festivals, Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot and Sukkot. And we're told to be very joyous and to celebrate, to make a pilgrimage to the temple, to bring our sacrifices, to be joyous. And it's interesting, the Gona Vilna was asked, what is the most difficult mitzvah in the Torah to fulfill? And he pointed to chapter 16, verse 15, a seven-day period till you celebrate to Hashem your God in the place where Hashem your God will choose, for Hashem will have blessed you in all your crop and in all your handiwork, and you shall be completely joyous. During the holidays, during the festivals, there is a mitzvah for us to be joyous and completely joyous, to have no feelings of melancholy or sorrow at all. Says the going to Vilna, you know what's a really hard mitzvah to do? To be joyous and euphoric and, euphoric and happy for seven days straight. Uh, on a practical level, how is this mitzvah fulfilled? The Talmud tells us, and this is maybe some uh, interesting social commentary for today, that for men, to be joyous means consumption of meat and wine, and for women, it's jewelry. And therefore, before the festivals, a man should buy his wife some jewelry so she should be able to fill the mitzvah of being joyous on the festivals, whereas the man himself should stock up on the steaks and the wine and to be able to fulfill that uh, mitzvah properly. A wonderful mitzvah of joy uh, during uh, the uh, festivals. And thus concludes Parshas Re'eh. Next week, Parshas Shoftim, more laws of Deuteronomy. I look forward to it next week.